that's a full good morning. Amen. All right. Hey, uh, one thing that uh, didn't get announced uh, this morning, that's nobody's fault. We got these Thursday afternoon. And uh, I don't know if this was something that's been practiced over the years. And uh, while I have made many uh, political jokes, I think you all see that I'm quite bar bipartisan in my concerns overall for any party right now. Uh, but that does not mean we should not vote. Many people have died for our right to vote. And... So what I was sent was hundreds and hundreds of voter guides. And this is meant to inform you of who the candidates are. It is bipartisan. We aren't pushing politics. The one thing I'm asking you to do is take this. It's a resource for you to know who the candidates are. And so we understand to be well informed so you can go out and research these candidates and vote your conscience. Now, I know that was not a very popular term in the Republican Party at one point, but I would refute and say one of the most famous quotes that changed history in mankind. It was when Martin Luther had to give a defense for his faith against the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church called him, called him to what was called the Diet of Worms. And he stood in front of all the pomp and circumstance of the Roman Catholic Church at that time. And they demanded that he recant his writings. That no man has authority over us. No man can interpret the word of God and tell us how to live. And certainly no man can create a corrupt system that says you can buy yourself out of sin. Now, as he's standing there facing death, Martin Luther... Standing there with all his works, some of them were not good. He drew figure, you know, caricatures of the Pope, and he has made of a big posterior, okay? And he looked at all these writings, and he knew some were right and some were wrong. But he knew his life's work, and he knew the conviction of God. And so he did something smart. And you know what the smartest people in the world do? I have watched over and over again in my life when they said, you can recant, or you can accept the penalty of not recanting. And he says... Give me one more day to pray. There's always a third option, folks. Whether it's in voting, whether it's in your life, whether it's in your decision making, there's always a third option. So they grant him one night to go back and pray. And as he goes back and he prays, he comes back and he looks at these people who have really the authority over to kill him, uh, ruin his life, and do many things. And he says, for this first act of writings I've put out that have clearly disparaged your character, I will recant. I was wrong, and this is of wrong character. But to those works that I have written, that have come from the word of God alone, I will not recant. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. God help me. This changed the world. We are here today because he looked oppression in the eye, and refused to give in to what kings and pomp and authority threatened to take from him. He would rather have had the word of God. And when he said it wasn't his intellect, it wasn't his smarts, he didn't get into a theological war. He simply said to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, God help me. So basically what he says is, I can't go against my conscience, and I'm going to answer to the Lord for it, and I'm okay with that. And so, with that, endorsing absolutely no candidate, because that is not my responsibility, I do feel that as your spiritual leader, and as a citizen of heaven, and as a citizen of this country, and for all of you who have fought, died, sacrificed for the right to vote, let us honor that. Let us be informed. And let us vote our conscience. Amen? I'd like to start in prayer. Almighty God, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you, Lord, that we live in a country that is, while some of us feel like it's becoming a tyrannical, tyrannical uh, world, I, I choose not to believe that because you're the king on the throne. And everybody here is, is just a part of your game. But God, we have a, a role and that responsibility in this country. And this country has a much greater role within the global scale. And one of the greatest resources 
the greatest resource, I believe, is the church. So help us to do your will. Help us to examine your will. Help us to exercise the right you have freely given us, God. Not just in grace, but with common sense. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Ow! Oh, that was kind of a heavy thing to talk about. That's all I'm done with that today. No more political jokes. I promise. We're going to move back into our series for the next three months. And we are talking about our new vision, the new chapter of where we're going. And it's so exciting to see so many people. you got people sitting on the sides of the aisles. Amen? That's great. And people are excited. Why? Because we know where we're going. Okay, where we're going is we are going to continue to talk about building relationships with Christ. And those relationships are threefold. Okay, that one, you need to grow in your personal relationship with Christ. And what I mean is continuously grow. God never said stop growing. There is no illustration of that in the Bible. You need to learn to grow in your relationships with other people. Three different times this week. I had conversations with newer people, and they come to me because they don't know how to fit in. We need to be aware of that. You know, we celebrate all these people and baptisms and salvations. Have you ever thought about reaching out, hugging them, and saying, come along with me? I can't do that all on my own. We need us all to continue to grow in those relationships too, amen? Amen. And we want to also continue to grow in our relationships in the ministry. Because God did not save you to sit. God did not save you to be alone. And he certainly did not call you to do nothing. You all have gifts and talents. And as your pastor, my one role, my one call out in the Bible above all things is to equip the saints for works of service. And you have stepped up and done that faithfully. Now let me tell you about that third aspect, our relationships with other ministries. Because I have one of the most odd experiences Monday and Tuesday. One of these key relationships we want to continue to grow in is our relationship with Horizon International, which is our mission trip to Africa. And you should know, when I first saw this on our ledger, and I saw how much money we were giving to Africa, and we weren't going anywhere, and I said, we're going to start adopting this idea. If we give, we go, and if we go, we give. Because some people don't have money but want to go, and some people can't go but have the money. See how we can all work together to build that relationship? Make sense? And I was going to tag it. And immediately Carolyn came in and said, don't you do that. <laughs> yes, Carolyn runs the church. And so, <laughs> so we brought him in. And we all saw all the dancers and we saw what was going on. And everybody bought every African trinket there was. And everybody bought, sponsored children. And like, how many people signed up? Is Rose here? Oh, there she is. Joe's over there. How many people signed up originally that wanted to go? Fifteen people wanted to go to Africa. I think they still have the plague in Africa. Okay? So we get this excitement. So we're invited to a strategic partners conference. Now, working in the non-profit sector, I understand we're going to go and we're going to learn a few things, but guess what else they're going to do? They're going to ask us for a whole lot of money. I knew that. That's what I used to do for a living. But that was okay because I want to meet other people that are going on. So Pastor Sarah and myself and uh, Rose and Joe all went down to the middle of nowhere in Indiana, where there was no good place to actually get there. Indiana is hard more, harder to maneuver than, I think, Sinai Desert for the Israelites sometimes. But we got there, and as we get there, we're getting there, we're meeting people, and I, you know, I, I don't want to go into all the past weird relationships of how this worked out, but we're sitting there, and all of a sudden as we're meeting people and talking to people, this, the, the, when we knew another uh, group from another country was there to sing, like the choir that had come here, and uh, they were talking, all of a sudden the chatter goes around. Do you know the chief or the queen or whatever of Limpopo is here? You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? The queen is here, the queen is here, the queen is here. And everybody starts looking around for the queen. And so finally, you kind of want to see a queen. I don't know about you. I've never seen an African queen before. So I kind of want maybe Queen Latifah, okay? But I've never seen that before. So I'm thinking, man, this is going to be cool. Well, all of a sudden, she walks in. And the room is just kind of like, yeah. Now, all of a sudden, you need to know this. 
Okay? Within meeting her, there are rules because in different, you know, countries we have different social customs. Correct? Okay? And one of the things we were told beyond a shadow of a doubt was to not what, Rose? Do not shake her hand. As a matter of fact, you kind of got the sense with her bodyguards or whoever they were, when she, when she gets up to speak, a lady gets up and just starts chanting very loud in African, this, this loud poem. I mean, I wish I had that kind of a... It, wouldn't it be cool if Steve just got up and just started going, Hey, old Ben! And wrote an awesome poem about me. I mean, it was really cool. Okay? And she was dressed to the nines. And, and, and you kind of want to get close, but you kind of don't because you know, like, maybe they have this secret power. We have the same Lord, but maybe man, this is an important person. And you are told, don't touch. It was like being in the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. And the four of us are like, ooh, we're watching. We got the one rule, don't touch. And she kind of walks around. She's got this very stoic look. So then we hear a little bit of the conference. And then we're told to go, that we're going to go to dinner. So we're kind of moving around and we're getting ready to go to dinner. And all of a sudden, one of the leaders in Horizon was talking to me and she goes, oh, have you met the queen yet? And I thought, uh-oh, she's right there. So I turn around and what is my first instinct as an American? <laughs> it was kind of a half step and it was like, oh, I, I stripped. Okay. And the other lady who was walking with her, her American escort immediately like, held her hand down. So I'm like, okay, I know that I can't hold her hand. So what do I do as an American? I say, the proper thing to do as an American when you meet somebody is to do what? Look them in the eyes. Do you know how many cultures think that is an utter offense? And I could tell you right away, I'm making eye contact with a queen and I think she thinks you don't make eye contact with me. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if she touch you, I don't know if it'll look. And I'm sitting there, it just gets more awkward. And so I finally, I'm just kind of retreating. I can't touch, I can't look. I'm like, sorry. And I'm getting my salad and we go sit down. And I sit down with Rose and Joe and Sarah and we're sitting there, we're all like, they're like, you met the queen, what was it like? I'm like, really nervous. I can't touch, I can't look at her, she can't talk English. I don't know what to do, but she's the queen. And so we're sitting there, and we were also told that you could not sit at this table. We don't know why anybody couldn't sit at this one table, because it was a very packed conference, but no one could sit there. Well, the queen, not knowing any better, goes, and where does she sit? At the table we were told not to sit at. So now you can't touch, you can't talk, you can't look, and she's broken the rule and you want to help her because you want to just be a good Christian and make her feel welcome, but you don't know what to do. And the whole point of this is what? Have you ever been in a complicated relationship before? Thank God. <laughs> And it doesn't have to be royalty. It doesn't have to be an elected official. It could simply be somebody sitting next to you in a pew. It could simply be somebody in your family. We just have these awkward relationships and we don't know what to do about it. Now, why am I telling you this? Because as we talk about going forward with vision, as we are building relationships with Christ, your personal relationship, your your relationships around here and our ministry relationships, I know this. If we're going to have vision, you need to know this. God has a purpose and a vision for your life as well. And if we don't start to seek this, it's going to be really hard for all of us to fit into where we're going. Do you see what I'm talking about? You know, one of the greatest white rabbits Christianity has chased over the last... I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, has been this idea of a purpose-driven life. Now, just let me tell you, just went back, checked the facts really quick. How many of you have heard of the purpose-driven life? Yes? Very good. How many of you read the purpose-driven life? Do you know what? So have almost 40 million other people. Why do you think that? Because at the end of the day, God created you with gifts and a purpose. The Bible speaks to this over and over and over again. It doesn't matter what gender you're, you are. It doesn't matter how you vote. It doesn't matter how much into Christianity you've been. It doesn't matter what. He has created you with plans and a purpose. And those purposes are good. They're not there to harm you. They're there to fulfill you. 
And yet, when we hear this idea of a purpose, we want to buy the purpose-driven book and go, oh, there's these five steps. I want to apply these five steps in my life. And if I just apply these five steps, I will go bingo. I will understand all things. Life will come together and I will have peace. And if you aren't a Christian and you're here today visiting and you go, you know, I don't understand this vision purpose thing. Sometimes, let me ask you this, how many of you know people who are non-believers who also are trying to find this identity or purpose that gives them some type of peace in life? And trying to find that purpose, trying to find that special call, trying to figure out what God's plan is in your life can be one of the most awkward relationships you will ever have with God. Far more awkward than my relationship with the queen of Limpopo. We don't know how to act. We don't know where to talk. We just want to get there immediately. And I know inside everybody in here, we have been planted a seed of this thing God has called us to do. And we want to get there immediately. And I think, I want to show you, one, I just want to throw this out there as we start. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. Now God may put something in your heart, but to get there, Solomon speaks very wisely about this in Proverbs chapter 4. I want you to open up to Proverbs chapter 4 verse 10. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a background. Last week we talked about our vision as a church and going forward and what we do. And I told you to write down one proverb. Listen to me. For the next three months, I want you to memorize one verse, one proverb every week. Last week was Proverbs 29, 18. If you didn't do it, catch up. Write it down. Proverbs 29, 18. You're going to hear it one of two ways. Where there's no vision, the people will perish. What I like is the other translation. Where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. When we don't know what God's telling us to do, we'll just do a whole lot of things. With no focus. It's like shooting a buckshot as opposed to being a sniper. And I, I, I knew this when I came in. The moment it was brought to my attention, would you like to go serve this congregation as a pastor? I knew absolutely this congregation's heart was to serve and to do the will of God. And this I also knew. This congregation has existed well because Christ dwells within you. Because you've had godly leaders and godly servants for years and years and years. But if you're going to get to that next chapter in life, I knew this. There was no vision. And you heard Pastor Brian say he wrestled his entire time here trying to find that vision and call. And through listening to you, through watching for the last year, it became very simple. We all want relationships to be built in Christ. And I don't want you to go through life having complicated relationships with God, trying to chase after this elusive idea that, God, you've got a purpose and I can't figure it out because I get frustrated. Have you ever felt that way before? You're like, man, I'm going through the motions. I'm doing everything I can, but I keep going. I keep going. I keep pushing. I keep pushing. I can't figure out why you gave me this gift and why I have this passion with this people, but it's not lining up, God. How does this work? And it becomes so complicated, a lot of people give up. But let me tell you this, beloved, it's not that easy. See, as soon as we talked last week about why Solomon asked for wisdom, because he didn't know how to lead the people. And then when he asked for wisdom, part of the recipient of that wisdom was the book of Proverbs. And as he received the book of Proverbs, he went out right at the very beginning in Proverbs chapter 1. And he said, look, they're to provide you with insight. They're to provide you to live a disciplined life. They're provided to help you continue to grow. Whether you're a new believer or whether you're an old believer, Proverbs can teach you over and over and over again. And he said, I have written this book for those three reasons. And then he ends on this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom in discipline. Step one, you have to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You go, well Ben, my God is a loving God. He's a loving God too. He's a graceful God too. And if you think he's this mean angry guy that, that burns ants with a, with a magnifying glass. He's not. 
If you read the Old Testament, time and time again, you'll see he's a graceful God. He's a loving God. He's a just God. And sometimes being a just God and a holy God requires us to deal with sin. And you see that character come out and come out and come out. But when we come to that point in our life where we've hit the bottom of where we're at, and we come and we say, oh, whoa, I have faced a holy God. That's great. Now, fear should never motivate us in life. But a healthy dose of fear, when you come and you see the Creator, motivates you to find the love of Christ. Or what Solomon is saying is wisdom and how to live a wise and godly life. So, over these next couple chapters, he is going to specifically speak over and over again. You'll see, to the sons, to my sons, to my sons. He starts almost every chapter, to my sons. So the immediate author and speaker is Solomon speaking to the young men, the young leaders of Israel. And he's telling them over and over again. But what he's telling them over and over again is once you have this, this healthy fear of encountering the living God, and you run to him for his salvation... This is how you're going to live. You are going to live a wise life. And so over and over again, he personifies the idea of wisdom, which most Christian scholars believe is a representation of Jesus Christ. And by the time he gets to the fourth chapter, he has so personified wisdom and what wisdom is and what wisdom can do. He rolls right into this idea of exactly how we live the life God has called us to be. Or, for common vernacular terms, the purpose-driven life. A life with purpose. A life with vision. A life that we know how to live and what that looks like as we pursue our call as Christians in the kingdom of God. And he makes it quite simple. I'm going to read verse 10 through 27. Proverbs 4, 10 through 27. On page. Listen, my son, and accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I guide you with the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. Now, as I read this, you're going to hear something over and over again. A path, a path, a path, a path. Well, watch this. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction and do not let it go. Guard it well for this, for it is your life. Now do not set put on your foot on what? The path of the what? Wicked. Or walk in the ways of evil men. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot sleep until they do evil. They are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness and they drink the wine of violence. The path of the, say that again, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of sun, shining ever brighter to the full life of day. But the way, say the way, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I've said. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are a life to those who find them, and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for this is the wellspring of your life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. Make level what? paths for your feet and take only the ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. So, why do I think it is much not, it is not nearly as complicated as we think to know where or the purpose or the vision or the divine call that God has called, called for each of us to do in our lives and how that funnels in to the vision God has for us? Well, it's very simple. The first thing I want you to see is there are two paths. There is the path of the wicked and there's the path of the wise. And he's going to contrast this between verse 10 and all the way down to verse 19. He's going to go path of the wicked, path of the wise. Path of the wicked, path of the wise. So I want us to really focus on the path of the wise because I like to believe you're all wise, Christian-fearing folk. Amen? If you didn't say amen, you're doubting in yourself. 
okay? I'd like to think that, so let's focus in a positive direction. I don't want you to be ruled by fear, because I said earlier, a healthy fear of God leads you to the love of Christ. That's why we have the law and the gospel. So this is not meant to beat you down. Let me encourage you and show you how you get on that path, because it's not nearly as complicated as meeting an African queen. The first thing you simply need to know is this. It's a path. It's not a place or a person. One of the biggest atrocities in Christianity today is we search for that purpose. We search for that meaning. We search for that call by going to what? Church. Or we go to what? conferences. Or we go to different groups to try to learn something. And there's nothing wrong with that. But on this path, he's saying it's not in a building and it's not with a person. It is you on this path alone with what? God's teaching. When we put people in places before our Lord Jesus Christ and we are seeking out that purpose in our life, let me tell you this. You'll never be who God called you to be. You'll never fully live the creation and the call and the gifts in your life that God created you for. Because people will tell you what they think is best for you. And they don't mean bad. They don't mean to harm you. They think they're doing the right thing. And it's not wrong to have those people in your life. But when people start projecting on you what they think you should do based on their observations, and maybe they know you a little bit. Maybe they understand you fairly well, but they don't understand you like our maker understands you. Amen? And so we say things. You should be this. You should be that. My parents told me I needed to be an economist. Now, John is a CPA, Randy is a CPA, and Steve, who is a banker, all know me well, and I spend time with all of them in the world, at, at least once a week, all three of them. And all of you would agree in a three-harmony amen, should I in any way be in finance? No. <laughs> but that's what my parents thought I should be. So I went to school to be an economist. Well, then my mom was in the restaurant business forever. And I really, secret, I like to cook. And I'm fairly okay at it. But I've delegated it off to my wife because she has, she burnt salad when we first met. But now she's really good at it. And she asked for it. Now she wants to give it back. I said, careful what you ask for because you just might get it, babe. And so now she's done it, but she's risen to that occasion. And so I went to culinary school to be a chef. And then all of a sudden, I thought I was going to be an economist. That didn't work. And then I thought I was going to be uh, a chef because people told me these were the things I was supposed to do. They were trusted advisors in my life. And then when I listened to the other people that said, you know what, you'd be really good at selling dope. I took it on. And it wasn't so good because I ended up in jail. But guess what? That's where I met our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know and hope none of you ever have to learn that way. But that's where I learned. And I'm okay with that. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And I'm okay with that. But that's not all who I am. That started the path. And quickly I understood something about that path. When I came to know Jesus Christ, all I wanted to do was know him more and more and more and more and more. He was the one thing I had to tell me, to guide me. And when you're at your lowest point in your life, when you come to that moment when you first fear God and you start down that path, God is the all-consuming part of your life. You want to know him more and more and more. Remember when you first dated your spouse? Did you not want to spend every moment together? We're about to celebrate our 14th wedding anniversary. We don't want to spend every moment together right now. But I know at the end, when trials come in, guess what happens? We choose each other at the end. We choose each other at the end. But sometimes when we're on that path, we think other people need to be on that path. But guess what happens? What is the path that's contrasted? The path where you walk with God and his instruction alone, the other path, not the path of the wise, but the path of the wicked, they're the one with people on the path. And when they have people on the path, what are they trying to do? They're trying to exploit those people. They're trying to use those people. They're trying to listen to these people as if they were God. 
And I think sometimes when the best natured people, and they can be in the, the most Christian places, we tend to elevate people over God. And I know why we do it, because we're afraid because we can't see God, right? But I see God in you, Larry. I see God in you, Linda. I see God in you, Jackie. And Glendon, you shine the Shekinah glory of the Lord. I see God in you, Randy. I see God in you, Ryan. I see God in you, Tom. I've seen you get more excited than you've ever been. You don't need people to tell you what, how God made you to be. You need people in your life to encourage you on the path to put God first. And he will guide you along the way. So no, it is not a building. No, it is not a people. It is a path that you first are to walk with God alone. Amen? Next thing I want you to see about this path is very simple. This path indicates only one thing. Forward progress. What does it say? You will walk and you will what? Run. You will walk and you will run. And the only thing when you walk and run is you will carry God's word with you. Now understand, you're on a path with God. He is determining your worth as a child of God. He is speaking to you as you're going down this path. Because he's God. And his spirit is there. But some of us are at a walking stage in our life. And some of us are at a running stage. And I bless the Lord at whatever stage you're at. But if you're just saved and sitting, you ain't ever going to figure out that purpose. You aren't ever going to figure out that call. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you just save and sit, you will never, ever find that call from God. And the church, capital C, has done a great disservice to Christians. We have brought them to the cross and said, sit. Instead of saying, go and empower you. One year ago today, I got up and gave my sermon. Do you remember what I said? I will not do the work. I w my job is to equip the saints for works of service. I want you to do it. I showed you last week what you did. God did through you. Amen? Immeasurably more than what we could ever ask or imagine. One prayer, one verse we focus on for one year. And he exceeds expectations every single time. Why? Because God is faithful. And we are faithful to following him and him alone. Not Ben, but you as individuals called by God, children of God, gifted by God, using your talents, using your heart, using your service, stepped up, you were obedient, you kept seeking, and you excelled every single time. All I did was motivate you a little bit and give you a why behind the what, which is vision. And you did it every single time. So as long as we keep going down this path and we keep moving forward, we are going to see God's plans and purpose in our life. But if all you do is sit... I assure you of this. You will not grow. There is no moment in the Bible outside of the Sabbath where God tells you to sit. Not once. Even when he tied down the prophet Ezekiel and said, I want you to lay here. He wasn't moving, but the purpose was when people moved by, they saw something. As believers in Jesus Christ, if we ain't moving forward... You ain't going to find out what you're called to be. You won't figure it out. And the one thing you're supposed to carry in Proverbs is what he says is what? God's what? Instruction. Or what is it? God's word. Now, you may say, Ben, am I literally supposed to walk around all day with my Bible and be one of those Bible thumpers? And am I supposed to run around and tote my Bible ever? Maybe. But God also said this, if you hide my word in your heart, you shall not sin against me. God also said through the prophet Isaiah, my word will not return what? Void. Sometimes when we tote our Bibles around, we carry our Bibles around, we thump them down on people. I assure you of this, that generally does not work to the lost. 
When you throw down your Bible tracts to people and you don't do it in love or you don't stuff a $5 bill into a server, please start doing that. They don't know how to even interpret those Bible tracts. I think it's great what you do when you go out there. I just worry about people using those tracks. I used to wait on Sunday mornings for years. Wait tables. And I can't tell you how many of those fake $100 bill Bible tracks I got. And this is more important than, than money. No, this is you being cheap and not knowing how to relate to a sinner. Because if you would have at that moment in my life over those two years said, hey, I care about you. And you would have said, and if you would have saw me, I did not look like, a, <laughs> I looked like I needed Jesus. And if you just would have said something to me about Jesus, I would have sat down and said, tell me. And there are so many people out there that want to hear that. So many people. And if you hide your word in your heart and you're walking and moving, yes, you're carrying something. But have you ever noticed when people power walk, they put those bracelets on their ankles or they carry weights with them? Why? Because they're trying to get stronger along the way. There's nothing wrong with carrying a little weight as you keep moving forward. Because what, what's it going to do? It's going to make you stronger. As you move down this path, you don't need to carry a church. You don't need to carry a pastor. I would be very heavy. You just need to carry God's word with you. And you'll become stronger and stronger and stronger. If we do not have God's word, what do we have? We have no life. And we have no way to discern, am I on the right path? Now, I want you to notice the next thing it says about the path of the righteous, because this one gets a little, this one may throw us off a little bit, but I want you to notice exactly what it said, because I wrote this down. It does not say that the path is smooth. It doesn't say that. Read it very carefully. If every word of God is ordained and God breathed, it was meant to say that. It doesn't say the path is smooth. What does it say? It says your feet will not be what? Hampered. You won't be held down. What does that mean? It means this. Perfect illustration. She's going to love this in the second service. When was Sia at the poll, Nate? Wednesday. Wednesday. I'm going to brag on you guys a little bit more, okay? Wednesday, you see you at the poll. If you don't know what it is, it's where they encourage all Christian kids to come into uh, high school and you get around a flagpole and you pray. And I was so impressed when I went there because darn near everyone at see you around the pole was part of this family. Adults, kids, everyone in between was there and led by our own Eric Mellinger, the quarterback, the leader of the school. Led by him. Led by one of our teachers that attends this congregation. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Now, as we get out, here's what Ben's thinking. Ben's been out in the sticks of Indiana listening about Africa and confused about beating Queens, okay, and drives all the way back home that night. Immediately when I got back home, I get a text that Taya's dad has a heart attack. So, I get out of the car, I run the house, and I say, Kristen, Taya's dad had a heart attack. I gotta go. So I run to the hospital. Well, he's just laughing and having a good old time. He didn't have a heart attack. Okay. And, and so now I'm sitting there talking and laughing, and I finally get home. I miss my kids. I just want to be with my family because I've been gone the last couple of days. And I get up early in the morning to go to this see you at the poll thing because what? It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. My path was not smooth. I was tired. But my feet never got hampered. And then when I pulled in, guess what? It was raining. And it didn't seem like there were many kids there. And at this point in your life, you're like, why did I give up my time? I didn't bring an umbrella. And I'm thinking, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. My path is not, you know, my feet feel hampered, blah, 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 blah. So we get out of the car. And uh, Chad and Aaron Olinger are standing there. As a couple, they both have these big umbrellas. And I just, at first I'm like, that you see a couple generally, you know, walk with an umbrella together. And it took me a minute to realize Aaron is yay big and Chad is yay big, so they both need umbrellas for that. So we are walking. It's dark. We got up early. It's raining. We are on the right path. 
And as we're walking, Erin says, oh, do you want my umbrella? I guess I could stand under Chad's. And we're talking, we're talking. And she goes, over the curb. Now, let's be honest. How many of you have stubbed your toe before and darn near lost your religion? <laughs> yeah. You slammed your hand in something and you were like, no. Ah. And that is exactly what Aaron did. I mean, she threw it down, started screaming, I gave this to you. God. No, I'm kidding. She didn't do any of that. She, <laughs> she's walking. She's talking. She just trips. We laugh and we keep going. Because she was walking the path. She was there for God. She was there for her purpose as a mother, as a steward in the city, as a steward of the school, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And did she trip? Yes, but her feet were not hampered and her feet were not held down. And she never at all even worried about that. She just kept going until I said, I'm going to use that in the sermon on Sunday. And then she got a little nervous. <laughs> And we laughed. Now, Ben, if our feet aren't hampered and we're going to keep going, and you say we trip, why would we trip? Well, your feet were, her feet were never hampered. That she tripped, but guess what? When we trip sometimes, it doesn't mean that you can't keep walking. Sometimes when we trip in life on the path God's put us on, it makes us a little bit wiser, does it not? I have tripped several times. I've darn near full, fallen and broken out my teeth. But I got up and I kept going. And you know some of the most godly people I know are people who have tripped themselves along the way. But guess what they did? They got up and they kept going. If trials are a source of joy, as James says in his book, why is not tripping a source of joy for us to learn as we keep going? If you are focusing on Jesus Christ and his word in your path and a little trip comes along the way, you don't ever have to stumble and your feet don't have to be hindered. You can keep going. But some of us get so motivated on Sunday and we're like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find my purpose. I'm going to run that path. I'm going to run it after Jesus Christ. And on Monday morning you go into your job and somebody becomes an obstacle that you trip over and it just ruins your day. So I try to, I want to explain Maybe share this with you. Maybe that obstacle is there to teach you a lesson. Don't focus on the obstacle. Keep focusing on your path and focus on what? God and his instruction. And his instruction is clear. Rejoice in our sufferings. Sufferings are a produce of joy. We keep moving. God has called us to keep moving. Sometimes the path is not smooth. But if you're focused on God, guess what? You won't fall. And now, my favorite part, and if I ever had a life verse, I would say this is what it is. Then he comes back, and he says this about the path of the wise. Verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are imputed with the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God. If you believe in Jesus, you are the righteousness of God. And your path is not said you will just get light. What does it say? Your path is like the first gleam of dawn. How many of you get up at dawn or earlier? And you see that come up. How much light is there? Almost none. Just a little, right? But when you keep walking, what happens? A little more light comes every day, right? And if you keep that instruction on the path, and God said what in Psalm 109? Your word is like a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If on that path you're keeping God's instruction, light will continue to shine. But when you come to know Jesus, you're not going to know your purpose, your call, pff, full light of day. You want to know why? Because the day I came to know Jesus Christ, I accepted him in a loading dock next to a dumpter where I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's where I was, with a low jack on my ankle to go back to the county jail when it was over with. 
That was my salvation moment. And I did not believe 15 years later I would be standing in a church in LaGrange County. I didn't care. I didn't want anything. I just wanted to be saved, free, and have peace. And I didn't know where to go. But I was right with God at that moment. So you know what I did? I took one step forward. One step forward. One step forward. And every day on that path, God made it a little bit brighter. The path of the righteous for all of us is like the first gleam of dawn. You just get a little light. But every day when you walk in God's word, what does he say? Your word will be a lamp onto my feet and a light onto my path. It will light your path more and more every day. And you know what that gives you? At that point, that starts to give you wisdom. And it starts, you know where wisdom truly comes from? Perspective. Over the last 15 years, the one of the things that ruined me most, I'll, I'll be honest with you, was institutional church. Now when I first became a believer, I, I, I would hide at my job to listen to Chuck Swindoll. I would hide at my job behind a machine to listen to David Jeremiah. I would hide at my job to listen to Ron Blue. I'd hide at my job to listen to Nancy Lee DeMoss of women's ministry. And I wrote down everything they said because I was so hungry for God. And then when I got in the church, all I wanted to do was be a part of the church. I wanted to be an active member of the body. That's all I wanted. And then one day I was given a position. And then in that position I got up, it was unprepared, and got up and spoke about my past life and how Jesus saved me. To 400 middle school kids. And they all just came running down the aisle and got saved. I get a phone call the next day from the pastor who couldn't be there and said, what did you do last night? Thinking I've done something wrong. All these parents are coming. Their kids want to be baptized. And I thought, is that bad? Is that <laughs> this is how naive I am in my walk at this point. A little light, a little light, a little light. But I wasn't chasing anything. But once I got that position, guess what I started chasing? I wasn't chasing God on the path anymore. What was I chasing? I wanted more influence. I wanted more ambition. I wanted a title. I wanted a job. I wanted a degree. So I get up and move my life and my wife all the way out in Alabama. I get a degree. Now I feel really smart. I become a, a pastor at a church and the church grows and I think I'm good. And then all of a sudden I go, I don't want to be a youth pastor anymore because that's what I first thought I wanted to be because the light was just a little bit. So I want to be an associate pastor. And so I move up to Anderson, Indiana and become an associate pastor. And it grows and grows and grows, but I'm miserable. See, I stopped walking the path and focusing on God. And what did I start to focus on? I started focusing on problems, positions, and people. The one thing the path of the wicked is defined as, I was not following the path that God called me. I stopped watching after God and I started left allowing the things of the world to motivate me. And then I get so angry, I leave the church and I go into parent ministry. And then I get into the corporate world and I climb the ladder. And I finally started making money, okay? I started to have position. I started to have authority over the eastern half of the country. I had a lot of people working for me that were smart. And I thought, now I'm going to be happy. And guess what? I was empty. I was empty. Because why? I was chasing after people, positions, and problems. Why would you chase after problems? Because if I can step into a problem and fix it, I look pretty good. Right? We all chase after those things sometimes. But the problem is, is when I took them, all those things, and I brought them into my path, I couldn't see God anymore on my path. And God is the lens through which we look through all things. And then I came back here and I thought, yay, and everybody loved me. And then things got real. And I thought, oh my goodness, here we go again. Now here's the deal. I have never, my wife and I have never had friends our 15 years in ministry. Never had friends. And I can honestly look you all in the eye and say I have met some of the best friends we've ever had. Some of the best friends. I get emotional if I think about it. We've never really had friends. We've always been nomadic. Always trying to walk that path. But at the same time, 
I have had some of the most hurtful experiences in my life. I have never seen people of God become so... I don't even know the word. Angry. So angry. And all I'm trying to do is file the right path. And if I let those people detract what I know God is calling my wife and I to do on the path, Michelle wouldn't stand up and be baptized today. Many people in here would not be here today. It's not me, okay? It's me being obedient and you being obedient to what God is calling us all to what? Do. And I learned something. When those hard problems came in, I knew my, my call in life is not to be a pastor. My call in life, after I look back at 15 years, is to influence the church by reaching the lost and raising the willing. Over 15 years of watching failures and successes, my burden is because I don't like the state of the capital C church today. And I can live that vision out here as your pastor. I could live that vision out at Walmart. I could. And as long as I have that vision that guides me, I will have peace with God. I will know my purpose. I want all of us to know that same thing. Your identity is not being a teacher. It's not being retired. It's not being married or unmarried. That is not your identity. That is not your full purpose. Your path above all things is God first. And God will bring all those things in along the way. It's really simple. Get on the path of the wise. And when you get on the path of the wise, you're going to know really quick. You won't trip if your eyes are focused forward. You may trip, but you won't stumble. Your feet won't be hindered. God has told us all on the path of the wise to keep moving forward. Looking back has never been a positive precedent in the Bible. Remembering what God did. Now that has been a positive precedent. Carry God's word with you along the way. And certainly be willing to listen to wise people. But don't let them become your God. This is the first step as we move into the next chapter of the first church of God. We have a vision. Proverbs 28, 19. Where there's no vision, people perish. But we all have an individual path that fits into that along the way. It's not that complicated. First step, fear the Lord, search after Him, get on the path. Look at God, don't look at other people. Two, your vision isn't a vocation. It's not in your job. God's vision is much bigger than your job or your relationships. We need to embrace that. We need to keep moving forward as individuals in Christ. We need to be proactive. We need to hide God's word in our heart. And by doing that, we will not stumble. We will not fall. We will continue to see God do more than we could ever possibly ask or imagine. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty God, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for the saints here. I want to thank you for the testimonies. And I know people are suffering, God. And I want to lift them up to you. I, I want to thank you, God, for everybody here that continues to go around as we continue to move forward with the revelation you've given us. Father, help us to have hearts that continue to move down the path you've created for each of us. Help us to look to you first. And along that way, you will shape our soul with experiences that help us figure out why you truly made us. Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. So stand and receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with favor. And may the Lord grant to us his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. I know the Colts are playing right now, so get out of here.